In tonight's Dateline Defense, the end of the Afghan war. The 13-year conflict that left more than 2,000 U.S. service members dead has come to a close. Now the country's military is in control, but can they handle the responsibility? For insight, we turn to our guest tonight on Capital Insider, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer. He's a CIA-trained senior intelligence operations officer, best-selling author, and senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research. In 2001, U.S. forces began operating within Afghanistan. Since then, 2,224 American soldiers have been killed, with the Pentagon spending more than $1 trillion on operations there. The goal was to fight al-Qaeda and dismantle it. Tony, was this war a success? The war was actually a success in the first 42 days. We now basically taken the not last 12 years to lose it. Uh, let me be very clear on this. We defeated al-Qaeda and its primarily primary uh, assistance, which were the Taliban, in 42 days. Uh, they moved into Pakistan. It was a failure, Morris, to go after the safe havens in Pakistan, which really resulted both in the current return of the Taliban into Afghanistan, and more importantly, the instability we now see in Pakistan, as noted over the past three weeks, we've seen multiple uh, Pakistani Taliban attacks. So by not defeating the Taliban completely, we now see a resurgence both ways. So uh, I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, we fought this war 12 years, one year at a time. The Taliban have been fighting this continuously with a long look at the horizon. They're at the horizon, we're not, and we're going to have to be very careful in how we move forward here. That is so true, and you put it very well. President Obama said the drawdown was a responsible conclusion to the 13-year-long mission. Some criticized his decision to pull out, but public opinion over the war has changed, and a majority of Americans don't believe the U.S. should be involved. Did Obama make the right choice? The, the, the right choice would have been to never have done the surge he did. Uh, he, uh, there's been more soldiers killed under his watch, Morris, than under George Bush in the prior uh, eight years of the war. With that said, I think we have to look at what is most important now. Uh, I think what we can pull out of this is stability within the areas we now control, or the government controls, which is uh, Kandahar, uh, Herat, uh, Jalalabad, Asadabad, uh, and basically Kabul. I think we're only going to be able to retain the urban areas. Taliban already controls everything else. It's more important what those troops do that we've left behind. Uh, they need to get back on the offensive and actually conduct anti-terrorism operations, which is what we did originally in the first 42 days, which made us successful. We should never have presented ourselves as essentially nation builders. And that when we started nation building, we became the, the enemy of both the Taliban and a lot of people who didn't want to have to suck up to a central government uh, that was run by Ahmed Karzai. That's a good point. You know, more than 10,000 troops will stay in the region to advise right. and train the Afghan military. Do you think they'll be able to maintain peace and stability? I was actually at the Pentagon talking to one of the senior officers about this this, this last week. And I, for better or for worse, yes. For what area we can control, they will maintain stability. With that said, uh, the, the government of Afghanistan is very fragile. And uh, frankly, let me be blunt, Pakistan is not helping here. Uh, Pakistan continues to provide aid and comfort to the Taliban and at, at their own uh, at their own hazard. Uh, they're fighting their own war with this. So yeah, look the, what the, happened to the school. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, the, the bottom line is Pakistan needs help too. I'm not sure if they'll ask for it, but something has to be done to defeat the Taliban. They have not been defeated in any substantial way over the past 10 years, 12 years, and if not, you will see all of Afghanistan eventually slide back into chaos with only those urban areas staying essentially uh, civilized, if you will. Yeah, I'm referencing the school attack where all those children were killed, right. children of, of uh, Pakistan military members. It's like having a pet snake. The snake will turn on you as well as anybody else. Without an enemy to go after, now that we're gone, that's exactly that's what's right. happening. Absolutely. All right, let's switch gears. The Russian economy is crumbling because of economic sanctions right. and an increase in the country's interest rates. President Putin is blaming the U.S. for reigniting the Cold War. Do you think Russia will keep up its aggressive tactics in eastern Ukraine and elsewhere, or do you think Putin will back down? Well, I, I love, Morris, I've watched his speech, how he played the victim card for over an hour. It's an amazing, it was a three-hour speech. It's, I'm sorry, three hours. Yeah. It's amazing to see a, a world leader grovel and uh, basically blame everybody else for everything he started. The bottom line is the Russian started this. They've violated uh, multiple nuclear treaties with us. They've done Cold War type things such as overflights and other aggressive actions. I think uh, for better or for worse right now, President Obama did actually play this correctly and push the economic sanctions. Putin has to rethink everything he's doing because if not, he will see his economy continue to slip into ruin. Uh, and not only us, I think the British now are taking this very seriously as well. Most of the Russian assets are tied up in British banks. So there's a lot more that could be done to damage the, the Putin regime by the economic powers that be. I'd like to believe Putin's going to rethink what he's doing and rethink his, his reignition of the Cold War. 
I don't know, you know, he's stubborn. He's still got a lot of nationalistic pride supporting him. It's just a matter of time before they say, look, we're tired of this, let's move on. Absolutely. And just remember, one of the things he's also said, he wants to diversify the Russian economy past oil. That's, That's right. one of the, the Achilles' heels here, Morris, is that they depended completely on gas Gazprom and other oil resources for their economy to be booming. And now that that's gone, they have to reconsider, and he may reconsider and come back stronger. All right, looking ahead to 2015, sure. Tony, what do you see as the nation's biggest national security threats? To individuals like you and me, cyber, clearly, this is going to be something that touches the life of every American. If not already, people have already suffered uh, attacks against their bank accounts, everything else. That will continue. It's not going to go away. And even at the nation state level, as we've seen with the Sony hack, that'll be more prevalent. On the nation state to nation state level, electromagnetic pulse, uh, a new class of nuclear weapons, which has actually been around for a long time, it's just been more uh, sophisticated. I think those are the two big strategic threats we have to worry about, both at the individual level and at strategic level. Otherwise, terrorism, we have to take seriously. ISIS, Ansar al-Sharia, all the al-Qaeda derivatives coming back. Uh, we have not done well on this. We're not penetrating the networks by the fact we're not capturing people, we're not interrogating people, we're not understanding how they're being able to regenerate. Therefore, Morris, until we penetrate the networks, by human intelligence, by clandestine operations, we will continue to be at a disadvantage, and you will see ISIS continue to grow. We have to get serious about this, but those are the three big things I see right now. It's always great getting your insight. Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer, Senior Fellow at the London Center for Policy Research. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Morris.